and we're getting ready to broadcast to Facebook. So anybody who doesn't want to be seen on Facebook or recorded, you might want to turn off your cameras. Welcome everyone. Aloha. 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 Nice to see everybody. Aloha. 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 Feel free to uh, put in the chat where you're from. While we're letting everybody still in, we'll wait a few more minutes. Wow. We have a great turnout tonight. This is awesome. Hello, Sean. Uh, hey, you made it. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Good. Glad you made it. Wow. Well, well on hold I almost dozed off but no and I was thinking oh I'll light a cigarette I have not smoked in a million years I don't know where that came from <laughs> well I I hope that we're not encouraging <laughs> I don't know what it, it was in here somewhere you know it was in here my mother had Alzheimer's and uh, I took care of her till she passed here at home, and she had quit smoking years before, and she said, I need a cigarette. I said, Mother, you don't smoke. Uh, <laughs> she said, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yeah. I, it's, in, it's in the brain. If you've ever smoked, it's in there, you know. Uh, hey, Maureen. Hi, how are you? It's nice to see you. Thanks for coming today. <laughs> Most welcome. Yes. Okay, well, just give it a few more minutes while people are still coming in. Do, do we have our usual millions coming in? Oh, we have a lot of uh, to, tonight. We're I we're breaking records actually. So. Oh. Uh, yeah, we're at 97 people so far. Wow. So, yeah. And you would think, you know, the, the IONS conference was over the weekend, and you would think that people would be, uh, you know, taking a break from this. No, no. Uh, I just get people fired up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. We want more and more and more. Well, this tonight is going to be amazing. Uh, for those of you that haven't met Mark. Not too much pressure over here, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sean, that's why I'm here. I, that's why I'm here. Sean, put, Sean, Sean put delightful and enticing pressure on me. So. <laughs> yeah, well, it's true. I, I'm very excited for tonight. So why don't we go ahead and everybody mute yourselves and our friend Ali is going to lead us in a centering meditation and then we'll go ahead and get started. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ali. I just recently came from Tanzania and um, the purpose of today's meditation will be to focus on the light and allow the light to go through us and receive the messages from the light. Um, where I come from, people celebrate the purple energy. Quite often they see sun as purple. And so if you can visualize purple color, that will help you. So I'll be facing the sun and I'll be channeling the energy of the sun to you. So when I say light, it basically means the sun. 
So get yourself comfortable and relax. Just slowly allow yourself to feel grounded, feel home. We're home. We made it. No matter where that is, you're home. Slowly bring focus on your breath. Allow thoughts to slowly vanish. And just feel the breath. Just focus on your breath. As breath is essential. It's the first thing that happens when we're born. And the last thing. To just allow to dive into your breath. With each inhale, we're bringing in the energy of the sun into, through your mouth into your whole body. Allow the energy of the sun and light to go into each and every corner of your body. And let it travel. Let it take all the corners, all the spots, just allow it to travel freely. And let's send that energy of light where you need it the most. It can be the tightness on your body. It can be something on your low back. It can be something on your elbow. Let's allow this purple light, which is the energy of transformation and spirit, spiritual transformation to go through you and heal where you need healing the most. You can slowly take your hand and put it where you feel you need healing and allow the light to go and with this energy of light, we're setting intentions to receive as much light as possible in real life, to be connected with nature, to be connected with this universe that is outdoors, this reality that was given to us. Let's allow that light to guide us into our day-to-day -day life through everyday healing and allow this light to heal and to invoke this energy of gratitude every day, every hour, every minute. When we feel off, let the gratitude of light heal ourselves. And with the energy of gratitude that comes from this purple light, we bring in love. And that love is the most powerful emotion that one can experience. And with this energy of purple loving light, we transform ourselves, allow it to transform, to eradicate all the habits that we used to have, our old selves. Let's shed the energy of the old and bring the new. Let that light target all these places that our subconscious wants us to work on and let it be easy as the light is given to us at ease. Let's focus on the ease of this transformation. Let's allow this light to work with ease and this breeze, everything that has to do with ease and breeze, just take it in with each breath. And let's take it deeper to the place where you feel like you haven't released yet, where you have not let go. Those pent up energies that are stuck in our bodies and manifest in reality. Let's allow the light to go even there and to release it. As the light magnifies, let's take a bigger ball of light, this big ball, and just place it there. And let us release and become this light beings 
as we all are energy and energy is all around us. And the energy of light says, you're not alone. I'll send you a helper. I'll send you a friend. It can be a neighbor next door. It can be your pet. It can be a bird outside that gives you signals, a synchronicity, because part of that same light. And when you look at the person near you, see that light within them. And be the role model of this light and project it to all living beings around you. Now with every little exhale, release, let go, and allow the love to flow out of you and transform you every single day. Ashe. Thank you so much, Oli. That's, ah, I needed that. Uh, <laughs> Got to snap out of it. Thank you so much. That was just beautiful. So welcome everybody to uh, Hawaiian Islands for our special talk, Inside NDEs, OBEs, Parallel Lives and After-Death Communication with Mar Marin Muter. Marin's a multiple NDEer, metaphysician, certified neuro-linguistic programmer, master in eco-regression and eco-meditation, author and teacher. For the past 30 years, Marin has studied consciousness, where it's located, how we're all connected, and while doing so, has treaded into the workings of paranormal, including la la past lives experiences. Uh, Marin has also spoken at IONS. She's been on Gaia with Regina Meredith and for Regina's book club, also several interviews personal interview series. She's also spoken on Coast to Coast AM, along with other venues. Marn also holds a fireside chat that is really amazing. On the second Sunday of every month, she holds one in the morning and one in the evening. And you can go to marnmuter.com for more information and to learn about her. So with that said, welcome. Thank Aaron. you. <laughs> Thanks for having me and thank you everybody for coming this evening. Um, it should be interesting. I have everybody on my screen so I can see everybody and there's quite a few people. So it's, it's nice to see you. <laughs> um, let's see, we're gonna, we have a lot that we're gonna be talking about this evening, um, but a little bit more about myself, I guess, since we're here with IONS, I'll talk a little bit about my near-death experiences to get the ball rolling. And then we're going to look at several things. We're going to look at the beginnings. You know, how did this life start? How did our universe start? And, and did they start in a similar fashion? Um, we're going to look at the third dimension, what it actually means to live in the third dimension. We're going to look at our electromagnetic makeup and the chakras and how the chakras actually aren't as blocked as you think they are. <laughs> we're going to look at the veil, how that's made. Um, we're going to talk about translating information from our consciousness into this um, life experience. And when we talk about translating, we're talking also about the translation of near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences and how sometimes that might look very, very scary or sometimes that might um, look a particular way, a way that you expected it, or maybe even possibly a way you didn't expect it. And after that, if, if everybody makes it through that, we're going to look at um, different types of after death communication. And then also, for fun, we're going to look at different variations of hauntings. That's us in a nutshell this evening. <laughs> um, but one thing I do want to say is it is very, very helpful to me. Um, if you ask questions. So the more questions you ask, the the deeper we can go in. I tend to feed off of the energy of your questions, energy of the room, rather than just 
being a lecture kind of girl because I'm not really a lecture kind of girl. I'll get really nervous. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's it. So my first near death experience was about three years old and I used to travel way out, way, way, way out. And I, and I've done this since uh, I was basically born. I would go out as far as I could possibly go out away from this body to explore what I would see um, on the other side of the veil. And quickly, why I would do that is because for some reason, we'll talk about frequencies and we'll talk about um, the mute muting of different frequencies when we look at the veil. But part of these frequencies didn't close all the way <laughs> for me. And so I see life almost holographic. And then I actually have to take that information and say, okay, I want to see what it looks like on the earthbound existence. So um, when I was three, I would just go and, and venture out. And on one of these particular nights, and, and the other thing is, is I have an extraordinarily low blood pressure. So my blood pressure is so low that sometimes I'll go into the the hospital like when I was pregnant and they'd be like how are you even alive it's that low <laughs> um, so when I relax or if I travel out I actually have put myself into cardiac arrest several times it, not meaning to not by choice it has just happened my body just said okay we're done we don't need to be here anymore so when I was three I started traveling out and I went out farther and farther and farther and I could feel my breath get heavy and when I mean by that is I could feel gravity pulling my rib cage and my lungs down towards the back of my body into my bed and I could feel as that gravity was pulling down I could feel my heart becoming very very quiet very quiet but I didn't I was a child and I was like oh, okay I'm just far enough away that I can't really hear it that well or I can't really feel it that well and then all of a sudden I was like oh something <laughs> is amiss and I turn around and I and I say I turn around it's not like I was going in one direction but for visual sake I turned around and said oh I need to go home <laughs> so I start trying to head back home and, and it was very hard and it was to the point where I actually couldn't get there. It was almost like there was a barrier blocking me. So I'm swimming, I'm pulling myself back and what was happening at that time was my father was actually reviving me and how he knew to check on me. Um, he had just gotten back from Vietnam and and I would knock on the wall and I'd go one, two, three. And my dad's office was on the other side of the wall and he would go one, two, three. And on this particular night, I wasn't knocking. And so he double checked me on his way out of the office and um, unfortunately found me. And I only bring up that he was back from Vietnam because that must have been, I mean, he was already around tons of death and dying and to have him walk in on a child that's not breathing and needs to be revived must have been very scary for him. For me, it was just a confirmation of things that I was already seeing. So it wasn't a scary experience. It wasn't anything. It was just kind of like, oh, I've got to go back to camp and camp being this earthbound life. So. That's happened to me a couple other times. <laughs> One, um, well, twice more as an adult that were where I would actually need to be revived. And it usually happens while I'm asleep because my whole body will just kind of shut down. But one time it did happen um, or it started happening. So this would be kind of a quasi fourth time when I was in Home Depot <laughs> and I was standing there and all of a sudden the whole world went away. And I was like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna get home? I'm like, home, what is home? What does that mean? Where is home? And I just, I don't know what happened. I think it was had to do with some of the fluorescent lights, you know, when they kind of buzz, that kind of sends me into almost a stroke sometimes. And I think that's what happened and my body just went and it short circuited and um, I was out. <laughs> so. Those are, those are my um, near-death experiences. And each one was a confirmation of 
what I was seeing and what I see in my everyday life. So it was more validating than it was um, awakening for me. Um, and it was also very interesting for me to see the translation and how my brain actually translated some of the information that I was getting into this um, life experience here, which we'll touch on that in a little bit. <laughs> so I am going to start <laughs> with a little opening and I don't no, normally don't read, but this is going to be part of um, my new book that's coming up. And I thought, oh, you guys could be a couple guinea pigs because it opens exactly where I want to open this talk. <laughs> so we're, it's called The Explosion, and this is the very first part of the chapter. So bear with me, please. <laughs> my hands held on the handle while my forehead rested on the back of them. Light illuminated behind the yellowish glass inside the heated oven. On the rack, a baking sheet with 12 somewhat evenly scooped blobs of chocolate chip cookie dough. From the moment the cookies crossed my mind, the makings showed up kind of floating around inside my brain, ready to catch them. The bowl, the long wooden spoon, all of the ingredients came out of nowhere. It didn't seem like they were there at all before my thought, but now all of a sudden there was utensils and everything was there, like the thought produced the material. On the kitchen counter, um, the items were welcomed. The, to me, they were almost alive. The butter was like those little yellow flowers at the edge of a field, and the sugars were like running barefoot after a butterfly. The white sugars like the clouds against the sky, and the brown sugar like the moist earth beneath the grasses. The baking soda was kind of like the parent guiding the direction of the rise, and the eggs went with the words from the little red hen. I shall do it myself, said the little red hen, and she did. The sticks of vanilla soaking in the jar were like trees of the dark forest and the salt, well, that was dangerous. Too much and it burnt your tongue and fought the caramel underscore of the cookies when done. As for the chocolate chips and the flour, those two ingredients meant we were almost ready. The flour folded into the butter mixture, making the concoction soft and full. It wrapped the chocolate chips but never incorporated them like it could everything else. It was like the dough was there holding these amazing pieces of chocolate, protecting them in the heat and sharing them with each bite. Warm or cooled, the chocolate chips also displayed the crust and crumb of the baked dough as if it were every bit as important, because without them, the cookie wasn't complete. But the heat, the sun, that made the next part like magic. Standing in the cool outer space of the kitchen, I opened the oven door and placed the cookie sheet, all dressed up with the scoops of dough inside, and then I waited. At first, nothing much to happens. It's like the oven, the cookie sheet, the dough, me, everything took a big breath and held it for a few seconds, and then we got started. The outer layer of the dough began to melt, spreading as each layer followed suit. It was smooth and wet looking, and the chocolate held its shape. It was as if one were sitting at the top of a slide and your heart is a mix of anxiety and excitement as, um, and excitement as sprinkles of bravery tickle just outside your lungs. You don't know whether to laugh or scream and somewhere out of nowhere, courage t touches your back and you slide like the chocolate chips into the melt uh, melting into the dough. Then a few minutes in, something happens a magic millisecond where a transformation takes place, a switch or a change. It happens so incredibly fast that if you blink, you long miss it. It happens so quickly, and then the expansion, or whatever it is, slows to a watchable rate. And that is until the burn approaches, where the cookies turn from just right to something else. It is that first switch, that moment that I watch for each time, even today, 50 years later, my hand still holds the bar of the oven and my forehead still rests on the back of them and my eyes watch intently through the glass into the illumination within the sun's oven, within, within the oven's sun, trying to catch this moment to go inside the magic. When inside this moment, the dough becomes a cookie. 
Is a cookie the only place this transformation happens? No, it's happening around us all the time. A cookie, is the cookie the best representation of this? No, probably not. But it is an example we can use with a grain of salt. One reason I am talking about having a recipe is that nature doesn't do things to trick us. Nature gives us clues on how things work every moment of every day on every scale. Rather than cookies, we can look at the germination of plants. Like the cookie, there are certain things that have to happen in order for it to germinate. We need favorable environment conditions for germination to take place. And this includes everything from proper nutrients, soil depth to the amount of water, temperatures, germination for germination to be initiated. Water um, ambition is absorbed of, um, one substance by one substance or another. For example, the uptake of water through the seed through the membrane. At this point, the um, seed absorbs the water and swelling begins until the seed splits open. So I'm gonna skip a little bit here. <laughs> um, but much of this process takes place underground where we cannot see it. It is shielded from the external world and protected. If we weren't able to dig up the soil or see a plant seed in a glass container to watch its process, we would observe it and, uh, as one day, suddenly, in an empty spot of soil, a plant just popped out of nowhere, right through the dark soil from what seems like nowhere. For animal development, this is very, very similar. Both animals and plants need to have the right environment. There is a magic moment for all of us, just like in our cookie example, filled with the proper ingredients and the environment becomes a cookie. Our moment, however, is more like the green flash of December's sunset along the Big Sur coast, where in order to see the flash appear, the conditions have to be just right, with clear, unfettered skies, no haze, no clouds, no obstruction of view, and a very distinct edge of horizon. And then the sun sinks or rises, and I know in Hawaii you guys get this too. <laughs> Um, and under these very special conditions, a burst of green light will appear for a mere speck of time. And when you or when we are created, we set off a burst of energy that sparkles like a firework against the dark evening sky, marking the onset of creation, the creation of our very own, very unique particle. Okay. So that is where we came from, <laughs> once upon a time. And I, I wanted to share that because the universe was created the same way. So we look at the Big Bang experiment or the big, no, that's a show and I've never ever seen it once, but <laughs> Big Bang <laughs> theory. And it looks like something came out of nothing. But on the other side of this Big Bang is a whirlpool and we kind of see this whirlpool as a black hole here. And these black holes can form in the middle of space and they can also form from an imploding sun. And you think of all that material that's going into this whirlpool, that's going into this black hole, that has intense pressure. And the pressure is so intense and it, and it keeps going, keeps going, it keeps going that it actually surpasses heat and becomes very cold. And as it comes down, and it comes down to this funnel at the point of where we would call the point of the black hole, it's actually going to invert this ingredient. And at that inversion process, at that inversion moment, that's when the cookie dough becomes the cookie. And it explodes. And at first it happens really fast. And so we have the expansion theory that heck comes out of that. And once that expansion kind of slows down a little bit, then all of a sudden things start forming and start coming to be. And that's what we are. We are part of that. When our sperm hits our egg to create this particular particle, so this Marin particle, at that onset, the sperm goes through the cellular wall of the egg. And a moment later, once that sperm and egg are compatible, there's viability there, all of a sudden it, it literally sends out a spark, a green flash of zinc, and it looks like a firework against the dark evening sky. And so we all start out like a firework. Now the firework is a very 
interesting. The firework um, is the onset of a parallel existence. And the parallel existence is very important to understand and know, especially as we continue forward in this talk. The parallel existence is just imagine that you are the center of the sun or you are in the center of that firework. And every ray that's coming off of that sun or every ray that's coming off of that firework is a different potential of this life. Meaning that one trajectory, there's a, there's a chance, a, there's a potential chance that you would be miscarried. There's a potential chance that you would have been aborted. There's a potential chance that you were um, stillborn. There's a potential chance that you grew and, and you had childhood cancer. There's a potential chance that you were hit by a car. There's a potential chance that you became a bank robber. There's a potential chance that you became an underwater basket weaver. There's a potential chance, all of these different potential chances. And your single particle, when we look at the world of quantum theoretics, your single particle can be witness and be in every single one of these rays at the exact same time. Now I'm going to read one more thing. <laughs> Sorry, this is a big reading day. Um, I'm also putting together, I have a book called The Book of Buried Letters, and I'm also working on a book right now called Letters from the Attic. So it's the same thing. I just buried a ton of letters, but I also stuck letters in the attic. So I've got this whole purple thing filled up with letters <laughs> from the attic. And I found this one. I was like, oh, we're looking at balance. And so I thought I would read this one really quick because we're looking at balance. And this is kind of... It's just a child, so bear with it. And children stub their toes. So it says, today I stubbed my toe. Um, I didn't bleed the blue blood from my veins. It was red. Blue blood needs oxygen, and red blood has oxygen. Even in our bodies, there is balance. For all, so it's bad handwriting. For all the blue blood, there is red blood. A constant ebb and flow where the red blood becomes blue and the blue becomes red over and over again until you stub your toe or get a cut or something. And then the blood leaves your body and it oxygen oxygenates. This is a big word for about an eight year old. Um, <laughs> and, and then it becomes no longer useful, so it dies. But it lived all the life, it gave life, it left life quietly. Blood didn't hurt when it died just the body hurt. It was kind of like when someone dies here, it is those left behind that hurt. Um, okay, that wasn't exactly where I was going, but it, it was an example that we need balance here. So even our body has to have balance. We have to have, you know, for every blue blood, we're going to have red blood. So there's a constant balance. And when we look at the parallel existence, it actually creates balance. So right now we're on a we're viewing. So we're actually just viewing this. This life literally is kind of like a hologram, and we're just viewing this potentiality of this particular ray, of this particular life experience. So Marin's life experience is experiencing a trillion different things simultaneously, and every single one of those has a little eyeball, a little vantage point, and it's, and it's watching what's happening down this particular trajectory. And for some of us, we might be on a trajectory right now that feels very out of whack. It feels very imbalanced. It feels very unfair. It feels as though no matter what we do, we can't get ahead. Or um, maybe some of us are having a really great experience and we're just thinking, oh, well, life isn't too bad. At least it's not too bad yet. For every one of these life trajectories, there is its balance. For every blue blood trajectory, there is a red blood balance. And that happens a trillion times. So we are gonna die, and I, 
you've probably heard this historically, you're going to die a thousand deaths. And sometimes people translate that to we're going to come here a thousand times and have to get it right. So we have to come back and relive our karma and come back and relive things and, and do things that we didn't do in the previous life. And it becomes pretty convoluted because when you come here, how in the heck are you supposed to know what you're supposed to do? I mean, literally, <laughs> you're coming here blind and and heaven or the other side of the veil or whatever you want to call it is supposed to be this glorious, kind, wonderful place. And it's not going to send you down here to trick you or to fool you. And that would be like, oh, well, you've got karma and or you've got these lessons to learn and good luck figuring out what it is because you're going to be here in eternity trying to figure it out. Nature isn't cruel like that. It's, it's not trying to trick you. So we live out these multiple trajectories so that at the end of this existence, when this particle, this single particle is done, all of those experiences come together and we get to live, meaning we get to feel it, we get to experience it, we get every yin and yang of this life. So if we were cruel and mean to somebody on one trajectory, we were treated cruel and mean on another trajectory. And that way, all of a sudden, we have a depth of understanding. And we have played out all of our karma so that this life is whole, total, and complete. It's not going to carry over. You're not being punished for it. You're living a whole, total, and complete life. And the reason this is important is because it creates something that is deeper and more powerful than love. Love is an earthbound term. This feeling or this emotion or this experience is so great that when you do hear people come back from a near-death experience or even potentially an out-of-body experience and they say, I can't describe it and then they just weep. And it's because there is no translation that one life trajectory can give, that the earthbound experience can give. So that's one thing I wanted to say <laughs> was um, that. And I'm looking to see where I'm going next. Hold on. I don't know where my little thing went. Oh, there it is. Okay. Beginning of the firework. Okay. <laughs> I don't normally have notes, but I just want to make sure that what I told Sean I was talking about, I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> Let me interrupt um, and, just real quick because I, a lot of people are really curious because you had this amazing childhood. So people are asking, what did your parents and family think about when you were writing these things and your experiences? That is very a good question. Um, I wasn't looked on too fondly. So... A lot, of ha a lot happened in my childhood, and I could see a lot of what was going on. I could see, I can see more of a whole picture than I do a single trajectory. And so when I talk about, you know, being able to see, um, and I, my primary vision is almost holographic, and then I have to come back to an earthbound. I have to remind myself, okay, earthbound, <laughs> there's a book or a wall there. I mean, I don't know how many times I've actually just kind of walked literally right into a wall and people are like okay that was the center of a wall and i'm like i didn't see it i'm sorry <laughs> um but i with that i could see i could see a lot and it always tears me up because i wasn't trying to um be cruel and I, I didn't come out cruelly, but I they took it as Marin's a witch <laughs> um, because I I could I would tell them a myriad of events that would happen years to come. So like as the years progressed, everything that I would say was starting to come to be, and it got to the point where people just in my family just didn't talk to me anymore. Um, so I ended up leaving <laughs> and I, my, 
first house was a phone booth. <laughs> so, and I chose a phone booth when I moved out because that was the safest place that I could afford. Uh, you can go into a phone booth and I, I'm hoping everybody here has been inside a phone booth, but if you go in there, you can lean against the wall the door and no one could push in because the door has to push inward and it's such a small cramped spot that that's what you do. So uh, I went from living in a phone booth uh, to being a nanny and and I did that for a little bit and then I was like, you know, there's a lot more going on and I actually went into um, consulting. I did a lot of um, consulting for uh, malfeasance or um, people that, that didn't treat others kindly, and also for uh, um, corporate malfeasance as well. So uh, I did a lot of consulting for um, a couple companies <laughs> that, I not for the company, but to find and turn in bad guys from a company that were stealing and uh, millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. So that's the kind of stuff I did. But in the sh in during that, I uh, started making chocolate, and I found that when I would go into meetings that were tense, if I brought chocolate out, all of a sudden, even <laughs> even when it was really rotten, it just kind of threw people off just enough. They're like, "Why are you giving us chocolate?" and and it would kind of calm everyone down. And so then I was like, oh, there's a lot more to chocolate than that too. So chocolate is a whole other thing that I did. So um, your family believed you, but they were scared. Correct? They they believed me, but uh, they were scared. And I, I think that um, they blamed me for a lot. And so when my, like my sister uh, had cancer and I and I told her she was going to die of cancer. I didn't I was like 11 or something. So tact wasn't there. It was just more like, "Oh, Misha, you're going to die of cancer and and you should go to the doctors or whatever it was that I said." Um and she never spoke to me again until her deathbed. I, I went out, She I was living in Washington State and she was actually still uh, in the Portland area, but she was in Washington, she was in Vancouver. And I, w I went out and I sat with her and we told stories and she wanted to hear the story of the flower lady and, and I was kind of telling her a little bit about the story of the flower lady. And she wanted chocolate. She wanted my chocolate. She says, Mary, I want some of your special chocolate. And that chocolate, again, is a marker throughout my whole life. But I am in love with chocolate, I think. Um, and it was it's more of a fairy tale chocolate. And then she asked me, and this is something I don't normally talk about, but she she asked me why I gave her the cancer or I wished it on her or something. And um, there's, there's two things. <laughs> One, I didn't do that. And I remember after telling her, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna be pink. Um, when I was 11 that uh, I would take it. I mean, I remember, I remember laying it, just give it to me, just give it to me, I'll take it. And, you know, I never breathed that to anyone. And on her deathbed, um, she went to sleep and I washed her hair and I gave her a back rub and, and I, um, it's just not a wonderful story. Um, I, <clears throat> brother came to me and he said, Marin, you are not welcome in this house and you need to leave. Um, so I said, just give me a minute. And he was like, no. And I said, please, one minute. And so I, I knelt by her bed and I, and I held her hand and I just said, please, just give it to me. I'll take it. And I said, I was sorry. And, and that was it. 
that was the last time I saw my sister. So my family has never forgiven me um, to this day. That's so helpful to experiencers here because there's a lot of people here today that are afraid to tell what they know and to stand by their truth. So it's yeah. very helpful that you're I, telling them. I think that an important mess, lesson that I learned <laughs> as a child and and is true today and I and I stand by it is unless you're asked even if you see things it is not your job to tell it you can appreciate the person more like I could have appreciated my sister more um, and and savored every single moment with her which I I did I mean <laughs> I still savor her today as I do things I always, I think of her I talk to her but um, it's not it's not anyone's job to say what they see uh, unless they are asked specifically so if my sister had said after I gave her the back rub and found the cancer she if she had said Marin what did you see then I would have said this is what I saw and then she would have been receptive and ready for it and other people would have rather than she not asking and in fact not wanting to know <laughs> like just get on with the back rub stop trying to figure out what's going on um she wasn't receptive she wasn't ready to hear it and so it makes it it makes a really big difference and the other thing that i make sure i don't ever do is i never tell someone a timeline i never tell them when they're going to die and the reason why is because all of a sudden we start living life differently and we and I want you to appreciate life and I want you to experience life and have it unfold so naturally for you because that's part of life's magic. And so that's one thing I want to say. <laughs> that is so important and so helpful because a lot of us like myself. I experienced that and I didn't know what to tell the person. I did not know what to say. So that is yeah. so helpful. Say yeah. nothing. <laughs> it's Unless tough, you're asked. Huh? Well, I, I know that there's a lot of people in that position. And thanks for sharing that, Sean, because that makes me feel a little better too. <laughs> yes. And you're you're in a family of outcasts here. I mean, yes, I am. A lot, a lot <laughs> We're of all us, great outcasts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why this is like for many of us, this is our home and our family. So. <laughs> yep, yep. All right. So let's see. Where were we? We were um, talking. Oh, okay, we we're talking about the fireworks, the importance of um, parallel lives. So we're going to get right back on track. Keep asking questions because it's is great. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about the third dimension really quickly. And one reason why living in the third dimension actually supports um, through the world of quantum physics, this parallel existence. Now we think that we see things in 3D. So we think that we're living in a 3D world and we can go to the movies and we can put glasses on and we can have things fly out at us and we are we are seeing a movie in 3D. Well, the thing is, is we're living inside the third dimension. So we are inside the third dimension, which means we can't actually see the third dimension. We're actually seeing the second dimension. And everything that we see is the second dimension. And how do we know this? Well, all I want you to do is put your hand right in front of you. Go ahead and put your hand right in front of you. and Tell me what's on, tell me if you can see the palm of your hand, or if you're looking at the palm of your hand, what's on the back of your hand. So you can't actually see that. I mean, unless you're doing it here on Zoom <laughs> in front of the video. But you can only see a, a plane of shape. And through different shadowings or colorings, we can tell, okay, well, that shape is maybe further away or that shape is not attached to this other shape, but we're seeing everything in shapes. So that's saying that if somebody is living in the first dimension, they're actually not seeing anything at all, at all, at all, at all. And there is no life at the third, first dimension, I mean, first dimension that it's not there. So that if you're living on the second dimension, you would ever see everything 
on the first dimension, which would mean that you're just seeing a line. No matter what it is, an apple, a book, what you'd just only be seeing a line because you can't see anything else. And the second, um, the, so the third dimension sees everything in the second dimension. And we could do a whole other talk on dimensions. I'm not going to waste too much time on that. But because we're living inside the third dimension, we have a very narrow point of view. And it is, it is um, I, an isolated point of view. That means that when we look at our little particle that's in the center of our sun, and we have all these different trajectories coming off of us, all these bursts of light coming off of us. We literally will see one of those, that little particle that has a trillion eyeballs to look down a trajectory. And then we have another little eyeball, one of those trajectory branches. But it is, it is isolated from the rest. And so that's the same as everything here. So I'm isolated now in this room that I'm in currently. I can't see what's on the other side of the door. I can't see what's, I mean, physically here. I can't see what's happening down the street. I can't see what's happening in Africa. I can't see um, anything else but what is literally in this room, what is literally in my purview. And so that's that creates isolation and that creates this feeling that we're living on a linear path where we're born, we die, and we have these ups and downs. We have these particular lessons we're supposedly supposed to learn or, you know, different expectations. And so that's just one isolated thing. Now, when we die, when this physical body dies, so, and our consciousness continues, when this physical body dies, then all of a sudden, we get to actually see the third dimension, which means that we actually get to see all of these life experiences that this particular life experience lived or witnessed. Um, so that that's really an interesting thing to look at is perceptually how is it living in the third dimension and what does that mean then consciously so consciously once this physical body is done and we look at this physical body as an observation tool and we have you know this observation tool is doing all these trillions of different things the exact same Marin is living in trillion different or witnessing or observing a trillion different life trajectories when this body is done when this observation tool is all done then i get to have this beautiful life experience and it's like a wonderful magic music note and that music note goes up and it feeds our overarching symphony, which is our consciousness, our overarching consciousness. And some people will say, oh, it's like a little orb. And sure enough, there we go. We're going to be a little orb of a music note. And we're going to have that music note be an integral, important part of our overarching consciousness, which is like a symphony. And that music note is whole, total, and complete it's not going to feed over to another music note. It will blend. It will be nice. It will make pretty music, but there we go. Um, thinking of this body, this body is an electromagnetic organism. And because it's an electromagnetic organism, we have a field of energy that exudes or radiates off of our body. And it also picks up on other energy around us. Now there's a ton of energy around us. I mean, there's so much energy around us and there's so much energy on this other side of this veil that, you know, how in the world are we going to be able to figure out what is important or relevant to our life experience here and what we really don't actually need. And so that's where the veil comes in. And we, and a lot of people, when they're thinking of the veil, they think maybe the veil's on the other side of the wall. <laughs> I got to get through this veil. I can't see the veil, but it's right here somewhere. And if I could just breach that veil, I can see everything and I can have this great connection with my consciousness or my higher self or whatever you want to call it. Well, the only place the veil is for you is your brain. 
That is the only location of this veil. And when we're in utero, there really is no veil. Our brain is still in development. We have a whole bunch of pathways. We have a whole bunch of reception points in our brain. And those are open. And so our consciousness is just observing the development of the body. And when we're born, all of a sudden, and I mean, there's, there's a lot going on inside utero um, because we have to figure out, you know, what the environment we're going to be born into is. And there, there's a lot of information that's coming in that way. But when we're born, what happens is these frequencies, these, um, I'll just call them frequencies today, in our brain, our brain mutes, mutes all of it. So it disconnects or mutes all of this, these other frequencies around us. And what it's going to do is it's very slowly in its own time, start navigating this life here. Meaning it's going to start saying, okay, is this relevant information? Well, what's the first thing that we need to do? We need to actually learn how to communicate. And the way that we're going to learn how to communicate is crying. And so once we figure out a certain cry, a certain pitch, and we can regulate that pitch to say, I'm hungry, or to say, I'm uncomfortable, or to say, I'm lonely and I want you to pick me up, or to say, I'm really mad. Once we start having comprehension of this communication tool, which is crying, what's gonna happen is these frequencies are gonna open a little more in our brain, and a little bit more information is going to come in because we have comprehension of the, the former information. We, we know what it's for, we can use it in our life, and we are now ready because we need more information. We can't just go around crying all the time. And our mother or father keeps talking to us and we have absolutely no idea what they're gonna say. So language starts coming in, along with a lot of other things. And these, these little frequencies, these little openings in our brain kind of get a little bit bigger and it starts letting words in. And when we can comprehend cat, then all of a sudden it's gonna say, oh, well, you knew cat, now how about apple? <laughs> and then we start learning apple. And we'll learn it in the language of the country that we're born in or in the language that is in our home. And words are strictly for earthbound communication only. You do not need words for ethereal communication at all. Zero words, you don't need them. This is strictly earthbound. So let's say you're in school and you're sitting in class and you're in first grade and you're learning two plus two equals four. Great, good job. And as soon as you can comprehend that two plus two equals four, then these frequencies open up and they allow more information in. So you're actually not learning in school that two plus two equals four, what you're doing is learning comprehension. So you're comprehending information from the world around you and your teacher's trying to get you to comprehend that a little bit faster or to put labels on it um, because you kind of know that two plus two equals four. You'll learn that whether you're in school or not because it's going to be relevant to your life experience here. So as soon as you get comprehension, you will gain more information. Now, we don't all need to know calculus and we don't all need to know all of Shakespeare's plays um, because they're not relevant to our life experience and are on this particular trajectory of this life experience. <laughs> and so your brain might not, it will just be like, I don't want to know it. I don't need to know it. I'm not gonna open those pathways. No, nope. and you don't need it because you've got a calculator. <laughs> so. Um, that's where the veil actually comes from. And there's ways to open up, you know, some of these pathways in your brain to allow more information to free flow in. Now, sometimes you get a great download. That's what some people call it. They'll be like, I got a download of information. It was absolutely amazing. And I can't remember any of it <laughs> because it wasn't relevant to your life experience here. So you got a snippet, you for some reason got this information, and then as soon as that moment was done, it goes whoop, and you're just like, dang it, 
<laughs> but you kind of have the gist. You kind of remember what it felt like. You're like, oh, it was so good. I wish I could tell you. <laughs> but um, yeah, if it's not relevant to this life experience, you're not going to remember it or in this particular moment of this life experience. So, all right, any questions so far to that point? <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, Janet wants to know, do we plan the trajectory before the soul enters the body for this life experience? Oh, nice. Okay, I'm gonna give you a quick no. <laughs> we don't we don't have to plan anything for this particular life experience because there's no lesson that we need to come down here and learn so there's no lesson so if we died in a previous life experience and my name was bob and i died and i went up to wherever i went up to and then all of a sudden somebody comes over to me and says bob guess what i'm like what you forgot to learn this and i'm like what <laughs> so you're going back down there and you can go pick your parents and you can pick your friends and you can do whatever you can pick. And if they want to come down and play this life out with you, you can. Well, we don't have to actually do any of that because, because we are living in this parallel existence and because we are living out every possibility that this particular life as Marin, I'll just use myself as an example, could live, there's nothing that I need to come back down or there's nothing I need to actually plan for because I'm going to be experiencing it all anyway. So I don't actually have to say, okay, I'm gonna have pepperoni pizza and I want birthday cake and I'm gonna have white cake on this birthday and chocolate cake on this birthday and I'm gonna to go to this university and I'm gonna meet this human being and this human being is gonna be nice to me or this human being is gonna be rotten to me. I'm not gonna be picking any of that out because guaranteed all of it's going to happen. I'm going to have a rotten person and I'm going to have a very kind person in my life on one of these trajectories. Maybe I'll have a rotten person and a kind person in one trajectory, who knows, but I'll be playing it all out. So no, the, the quick answer to that question is no. Yeah. So, so then explain karma. No karma. You're not coming down here to play with karma because you're living karma out right now. So there's no punishment, correct? No. And the reason, I mean, we can get into, you know, what evil is and what and all that is, but that's all earthbound. That all has to do with the malfunctioning of this humanoid body and it could happen only on one of the trajectories. So let's say that I was a mass murderer on one of my trajectories. Well, on another trajectory, I might not be a mass murderer, but I will be playing out both of those things. I will be on a trajectory where I am very mean and cruel to people. And I'm gonna be on a trajectory where I'm very kind and nice to people because I have to balance those out. Um, it needs, to, it, it has to be balanced life is balanced nature is balanced the universe is balanced and that's and so in order for our life to be balanced we have to live out a whole life of marin i i use the apple pie i i i have a quick story of apple pie really fast i was an apple in this life in the in a former life and i was on an apple tree and i got to do absolutely everything an apple did i made apple juice and i made apple sauce and I did all these things except I didn't become an apple pie and I get up and someone ate me and I threw the core away and, I, and I'm all done being an apple and I'm up in wherever it is heaven or wherever it is and and this spirit comes over to me and says you know you did such a great job being an apple but you, you forgot one thing and you're thinking okay what did I forget well you know you didn't become an apple pie so you need to go back down and become an apple pie. Perfect. I will go back down and become an apple pie. So you can talk this as a lesson or as karma or however you want to put it. So ah, I am a little bud I, and I come out and I'm starting to grow and I'm green and tight. And then all of a sudden I start plumping out and I'm looking around I'm like, wow, it smells so sweet and beautiful in this orchard. And I look at my skin and it's orange and it's got a really weird feel to it. <laughs> 
and I'm in an orange grove and I'm an orange. And I also don't remember that I'm supposed to be an apple pie. <laughs> so now I'm feeling like oh, there's something missing in my life. And I go and I talk around to other oranges. I'm like, you know, there's just something missing. Something's missing in my life. And I find one orange that's like a mystic orange. And this mystic orange says, Orange Marin. I'm like, yes. You forgot to be an apple pie. I'm like, what? <laughs> well, you've got to go be an apple pie, or you're not going to feel you're not gonna fulfill this karma, or you're not gonna fulfill this um lesson you were supposed to learn. And I'm looking around, I'm like, I'm supposed to be an apple pie? And yes, that's what you have to be. And I'm an orange. There's no way. I mean, even if a farmer squeezed me into an apple pie, I will not experience what it's like to be an apple pie. Also, if I even came back down as an apple, I might have been a uh, Granny Smith prior, and now I'm a Johnna Gold. So I can't possibly play out that apple, what it's like to be an apple pie as a Granny Smith. So karma doesn't carry over. There you go. The end. <laughs> and so people are wanting to know, did this all come from the NDEs? Was it before the NDEs? How did you get this information also? And then, and then where is it being downloaded from? Your higher self? Where? Okay. Good questions. I've basically known it since the day I was born. And like I said, I was born kind of like in this weird in-between veil. So these pathways in my brain didn't close all the way. And the best example to share this um, is to look at savantism. Now, we have children that are born and they, at two years old, can draw better than, you know, a master. And you have children that are two years old that can read or know math. There's children that at four or five years old can understand calculus. They can understand um, physics, all, all these things. And there's no way that they should know this information. And this is because when they were born, for some reason, some of these pathways in their brain didn't mute. So it's not that, it, you know, you're never disconnected. They're just muted pathways. And for me, for some reason, some of these pathways didn't close all the way. And they remain open to this day. I mean, sometimes I can, I can quiet, I can force quiet them, but if I'm just relaxed, I'm, I'm kind of like in this in-between space. So that's really where a lot of this information came from is because there are frequencies that aren't closed all the way. Now, when I had my NDEs, what happened was it was more of a confirmation. It was more of a, you know, Okay, I went home and whew, felt really good and now I got to come back down here. Like I said, it feels like I'm at camp here. Um, where is the information coming from? Well, none of the information for any of us is inside this body. We, this body is an observation tool. So that's how I want you to look at it is you are an observation tool. And your consciousness doesn't live inside this body. You know, that's why scientists have a very hard time finding where memory is located. So we can put probes on a brain, in the brain um, and find out what electrically it looks like when we start recalling memory. But we have to listen to that word. It's, it's memory recall. So we're open those are when we see the lights going on in our brain those are different pathways opening and closing that are going into our consciousness that are so our consciousness is out here our consciousness resides on the other side of the veil we are all connected to what you would call as a higher consciousness but it's let's just call it our consciousness for what it is and if we look at the consciousness as a symphony and this life as a music note this observation vehicle that we're in and this life experience is a music note and it just goes up and feeds our consciousness up here. So we all have access to our consciousness and we, and the information that we have every single day. So every time you have a thought, every time you're doing something, 
know that that thought, no matter how minuscule you think it is or how non-important you think it is, is absolutely magnificent because that's showing you and telling you that you are directly connected to your consciousness, to your higher consciousness. You are directly connected to the other side of the veil and no one is closer to you than you are for your consciousness. There's, there's no one that can be closer than that. So I'm getting my information the exact same place you're getting your information. Hi, Mike. Hi. I have a question. Can I ask you? Sure. So during your interview with Regina Meredith, you said, in quote, there is nobody connected to the other side of the veil closer than you. That means no one knows the other side of the veil closer than you, and you have direct access to it. And we can find ways to open that up. Can you talk more about that? How we can open that up? Sure. Thank okay. You. So, and that's a great quote because that's exactly what I was just saying. So when I talk about no one is closer to the veil than you, it's because your veil is in your brain. So we all have a veil and it's all in our brain. That's it. That's the only location our personal veil is. Once we get to the other side of the veil, all of our consciousness can communicate with each other. We can be having a conversation and we can, you know, eavesdrop into that from this earthbound life. But um, out there, it's all, it all works the same. Nature isn't making a trick or a joke out of it. So there's ways that we can open up some of these frequencies. And one of the fun tricks that I do, a good party trick. <laughs> um, and so we'll do it now for fun is um, go ahead and put your hands together and, and bring your elbows up. So I'm going to stand up so you can see me. So you kind of want to sit. So we're going to bring our elbows up. We're going to press our hands together and we go ahead and press as hard as we can. And as you're pressing your hands together, I want you to be kind of pressing from your shoulders. So press from your shoulders and your elbows into your hands. And we're going to hold this for like a minute or a minute and a half. So, And I'll just keep talking. You guys keep pressing. And when I say press hard, I mean press hard. What we're going to do is because we're an electromagnetic organism, we're actually creating a circuit right now. So a circuit that's not normally there. And when I say go, what you're going to do, so just watch me now, but don't do it yet. You're going to drop your elbows and your hands might fall down forward a little bit. Keep your hands together, relax your wrists, okay, relax your hands, and then very slowly you're going to start pulling your hands apart, very, very slowly. So go ahead and keep pressing, pressing, pressing. As you pull your hands apart, slowly, once you get about an inch or an inch and a half apart, when you breathe in, you're going to have your hands separate a little bit more, and when you breathe out, or you can hold your breath, I just want you to feel, don't try to force your fingers together, I just want you to feel if there's tension between your hands. And then again, when you breathe in, you're going to pull your hands out just a little bit. And then when you breathe out, or if you want to hold your breath, just see if there's tension between your hands. <clears throat> so we have about 30 more seconds. <clears throat> And when you're ready, you can go ahead and drop your elbows and let your hands fall wherever they're comfortable and relaxed and have your wrists nice and relaxed. So when you're pulling your hands apart, you're actually pulling from your elbows. And very slowly, just very, very slowly, go ahead and start pulling your hands apart. So when you breathe in, your hands come apart a little bit. And when you breathe out, or if you want to hold your breath a second, just see if you can feel tension between your hands. And then we'll pull them out a little more and see if you can feel tension. Now I know some of you have played this game with me before, 
and sometimes we get about here or farther and you start feeling this energy become pliable so it almost feels like taffy and you can pull it and pull it and squish it and it almost feels like a plasma and it and when you're doing that you're actually touching the other side of the veil that's the other side of the veil you're touching it you're holding it in your hands right now it's pretty cool <laughs> um so how do we open up so you guys can keep playing and keep practicing and i'll go ahead and keep talking <laughs> So how do we enable ourselves to open up some of these pathways in our brain? Well, this game, this hand game, sometimes, you know, you can rub your hands together before you do it if you want to, you know, try to incite more connection if you want. But the more you play this hand game, the more you play with this plasma, you won't actually have to have your hands touching and pressing hard. You'll be able to just to call it. And then all of a sudden you can just call it and, and feel it. You can actually pull it up and you can actually bring it up here and you can start feeling that plasma around your neck. You can bring it over here. You can bring it around your head and you can actually feel the energy. You can actually, I don't know if you, for me, if I go into an MRI machine, I can feel the magnet moving my brain. It feels like my brain's going in a circle. But you can take this plasma and you can do the exact same thing because we've polarized this energy and we can actually feel it moving around um, the current in our brain a little bit. Now, after you get familiar with this even more, you'll be able to incite this energy without having to use your hands at all. Sometimes I like to think of Mr. Miyagi from the um, Karate Kid. You'll see him, he looks like rubbing his hands ah, and it's really, really hot. And then he sticks it on Daniel's knee and Daniel's knee is all better. Well, it's not necessarily the heat, it's the electricity, it's the, the frequency that he's putting in there. So he's actually creating current of energy and feeding that energy into Daniel's leg. So kind of like Reiki. But we can incite this. Um, other ways that we can do this, that we can actually open up some of these pathways, is when I uh, do meditation sessions, I always, always, always start the same way. And I tell people, I want you to go ahead and keep your eyes open and I want you to sit and relax and go ahead and just relax. Relax your shoulders, relax your hands, relax your arms. And I have them hold maybe a book if, if they're new to meditation or I have them hold a stone or something and we're just going to go ahead and relax and we're going to look across the room to the ceiling or if you're outside you're going to look across to find one point. And you're going to focus in on this one point after you kind of observe the ceiling or the tree or whatever you're looking at. And when you come in, you find one point. I want you to put all of your focus into that one point. And that one point, I'm going to have you continue to concentrate on that one point on the ceiling, wherever it is. And then you'll close your eyes. And when you close your eyes, we're going to start bringing a light out of that point. So I want you to start imagining a ball of light come through that point on the ceiling and just kind of hover. And now you've got this ball of light and you're going to have it hover. And slowly we're going to bring that ball of light right in to our head. <laughs> right in, it's going to hover right over us and we're going to slip it right in comfortably underneath our hair. We're going to slip it right into our skull and it's going to blanket our brain and this is what a really deep meditation is going to do and you can practice this and this is going to start opening up these pathways because it's going to say okay this energy that I am bringing in is relevant because I'm bringing it into my brain and because it is now relevant and really that energy doesn't have anything in it is just energy there's not a point or purpose to it, it's just energy. And but what's what it's doing is it's actually creating a pathway for you to go straight into that consciousness. It's kind of a sneaky back door for your brain to head right up in there and be able to get more of this information. So, Mike, that was a really good question. I hope that answered it. <laughs>
And then there's a couple of questions about trajectories and parallel lives. Can we switch trajectories? Can we can we switch in mid <laughs> midstream? No. And <laughs> do our parallel lives can they intersect after? No, um, we cannot. We are not going to switch because remember we're the exact same particle, and every single trajectory is incredibly important. Every single trajectory is just as important as the other one because it's a balance. So we can't. <laughs> We can't jump from one to another if we're having a really bad trajectory right now. <laughs> right now, at this very moment, you're having a bad trajectory, but you're also having an extraordinarily good one, too, I promise. <laughs> but you're not going to be able to bounce back and forth. Now, these trajectories are not on the same universal plane. We're actually so. Um, you might have heard of um, the multiverse. So there's, um, in quantum theoretics, we, we study what's called a multiverse. And there's multiple universal layers of the exact same thing. And so if we look at the sun, if we pretend our, our little particle is the middle of the sun, and then we have all these trajectories coming out off of us, every single one of those trajectories is another universal plane, set up the same way. So it doesn't get overcrowded. It doesn't you don't bonk into each other we have to remember that we right now are only viewing second dimension we are only living in third dimension and we cannot imagine we cannot even come close to imagining what the fourth dimension is because that is completely out of this human experience so it's not relevant we don't need it but what we can say is what the fourth dimension might view down in the third dimension, but there is so much more out there that there's plenty of room. So I, I know that some people are like, aren't we going to get crowded? <laughs> if all these parallel lives are going on, uh, you're not going to get crowded. It's just like how much information is on the internet. <laughs> there's a lot of information on the internet. And is the, is the sky crowded? Are you having trouble walking through <laughs> the sky right now? No because it's, it's running off of something different. And there's a lot of, and each one of us has a computer going and each one of us is pulling information. And so all of that information is there. And so whatever you're experiencing now, you can't sidestep it, go, go through it, you're not embrace gonna sidestep it. it. Yeah. And if it's really hard and if it's really bad, step back just for a moment and observe it. Because when we learn to observe life, then all of a sudden we have more intuition, we are more peaceful, and we have um, a calmness about us, no matter what the storm is. Uh, so I had a woman the other day email me, and it, it was just really sweet, that she said, you know, how, how is it that you can go through some really hard, terrible times in your life and still have somewhat of a childlike quality? And I, I was like, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. But um, I, I would say that the key to that is observation. And also the key is so observation and that every single thing that is happening around me or every thought that I am thinking is my confirmation that I'm actually connected and, and it reminds me that I'm observing this particular trajectory. I'm observing what it, let, what it feels like to hurt. So um, recently I broke my leg last year and there's a reason why I will not ever go under a general anesthetic again or um, have any anesthetic no matter what no matter what the surgery is and that's because the last time i did that i woke up and my son was dead so i went in everything was fine i woke up and i'm groggy and i pick up my phone and i get the message that my son um, died so i was like i'm never going under anesthesia, anesthesia again so <laughs> i Last December, I, I broke my leg <laughs> and, and I did a really good job. 
at breaking my leg. Um, so I had to get up and I had to walk like a quarter mile back to the house. And I hobbled around on it for a day or so thinking, yep, this is more than a sprain. And I go in, I find out I have to have surgery. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to do the surgery, but I'm not having anesthetic. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm going to be awake. And they said, what? And so the anesthesiologist was next to me and, and we spoke. And, and I said, if it's too much, you can't, you go ahead and give me something. But um, I stayed awake during it. My body naturally fell asleep a little bit during probably some of the harder times. But then I woke up and continued talking to the doctor and the anesthesiologist. And so um, through observation, through being able to step back and observing what the human body is going under or what's happening to the human body, it almost helps um, my dad's voice is coming to my head. He's like, calm, cool, and collected. Because <laughs> my dad would always be, you need to be calm, cool, and collected, no matter what the situation is. But I'm thinking it's more of an observation and knowing that I'm connected to the other side of the veil and knowing that I can, I can step back because as long as I am breathing, as long as I am here and this body is somewhat viable, then it too shall pass. So whatever that pain is, and no matter what you're going through at that time, it will pass. It will pass. Sometimes it takes a lot longer and sometimes it's, it's shorter, but it will. And um, I forgot exactly where I was going, but there you go. <laughs> that, and that's so important because a lot of us, I remember maybe uh, 15 years ago when I was going through a dark night of the soul and I tried every way around it. And finally, when I realized you just have to go through it, I mean, you can't sidestep this stuff. That's what mm -hmm. we're here for. That's right. That's right. And if you go into it, so yeah, I, I like how you say um, you walk into it. You go into it. So if, if it's excruciating, walk into it, go right inside and give that pain a color, give it some shape, give it some light and walk right into it. So if you're imagining that ball of light from the ceiling that we were talking about earlier, go inside whatever feeling that is, because when you get inside that feeling, all of a sudden you're protected. <laughs> it's like a shield. <laughs> That's like the magic that nobody tells us. Yeah. <laughs> like inside. embrace it. What is it here to teach us? And all of a sudden yeah. it's your yeah, friend. But don't even worry about what it's to teach us. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, then you're trying to label it. And the second you try to label it, you make it 10 times worse. <laughs> So go inside it. That's why I say give it a shape, give it a color, give it an energy, give it a, you know, whatever it is, but try to keep words out of it. Because words allow you to cling on to things. Have you ever had that Ferris wheel in your mind where you're like all the bad things that have happened in your life and all the people that are making you mad and you can't get off this Ferris wheel in your brain because you're labeling every single one. I'm so mad at, I'm really mad at this. I skinned my knee, I spilled my coffee. I did all these things. <laughs> and because you're labeling it, you're holding on to it. Yeah. The second you remove vocabulary, the second you remove the words and you can just give it shape and you look at it in our two dimensional viewpoint, then it's not going to hurt. It's not going to, it's not going to knock you senseless. Now, sometimes like when my son died, I was, I, I died. I literally, I, I would say that that was the most profound death experience I've ever had because I wanted more than anything to leave this body and go find my son. I, I, I just wanted to go find him and bring him back and put him right here and hold him. Um, but even, and it was really, really, really a surreal experience because I went, I had to go inside this nuclear bomb and inside it, 
and and um, people, I, I ask, oh, it must have been devastating, and it was devastating, but at the same time, it's one of the most beautiful experiences I have ever witnessed in my entire life. Absolutely stunning. And beautiful and stunning don't always mean joyous. <laughs> But it's absolutely stunning. When I went inside this explosion of life, this explosion of whatever happened, it was like a nuclear warhead, I saw, I saw the sunset, my son died underneath. I saw the movement of his body on the hillside for hours moving just gracefully. It was almost like Taekwondo. He was an army ranger, but in this moment, absolutely beautiful and I saw the staff that he was moving around with but it was a rifle and I remember I was in yoga the first time I was able to complete staying in and I don't I didn't remember my body just going into Shavasana on its own but it did and my face was just dripping wet but I was inside I was inside this and I was with him so he didn't have to do it alone But it was amazing because when the crack of thunder rolled in the background, that was the same moment that the gun went off and his body fell. But it was so amazingly beautiful when his body fell and became the sunset. that because I was able to go inside this, because I walked into this nuclear bomb, every night for months and years afterwards, when I couldn't breathe because I missed my son so greatly, that when that sunset came, we were together because that binding of whatever it was and that strength and that surreal moment was ethereal and was brought back to me every night with that sunset. So don't be afraid to walk into that pain ever because inside that pain, there is a gift, not necessarily a lesson. We're not going to label it, but there is a gift inside that. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, <laughs> We'll jump just ahead just for a second and share that your experience with your son that that you communicate with him every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just to brighten everybody up for a second. Da -da -da! Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we're gonna bring the room back up now. 
<laughs> no, he, it was, it, when my kids were young, we would always tease around in the, in the car. We'd be driving around. Okay. If one of us dies first, we have to promise to haunt each other. And we're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll haunt each other. So <laughs> my son, David has not failed on that <laughs> from the second, um, I think from the second he left, he came to visit, but I was under anesthesia. <laughs> but when I was on the plane the next day, the, the, I, again, chocolate is a big deal in my life, but I would, I always give chocolate out. I have chocolate with me all the time. And if you meet me, I have chocolate for you. And, <laughs> but no one really ever used to give me chocolate because they didn't know really. <laughs> and that, that was one of the first messages from my son was this, this flight attendant. I was about to age myself with stewardess, but flight attendant <laughs> walked back towards me and asked if I needed anything. And obviously I was like devastatedly crying and I said, no, I'm fine. Thank you. And she goes back to the front of the plane and on her way back, she just stops in her tracks and she comes back. She says, this is going to sound really strange. <laughs> she says, and I don't know why I'm saying this. And I said, okay, well, you can tell me that's okay. She says, would you like some chocolate? I've got some in my purse. <laughs> and that was like the very first sign from my son. He sent, um, he would change my telephone number and computer systems to his telephone number. He would turn the microwave off and on. His number is three. So he'd push the button on the microwave three times during dinner and the microwave would turn on. I would get up, I'd turn the microwave off and then I'd sit back down and all of a sudden beep, beep, beep. <laughs> and then it would turn back on. I'd turn it off and he would do it like three times. Um, he would pick padlocks because as any good mother, I taught my children to pick locks <laughs> when they were young. Um, <laughs> and so he would, I had this padlock and he would actually pick it up. And um, a very good friend of mine that is a medical oncologist who before me was like, yeah, life is done. Life is done. <laughs> I was like, come look at this, come look at this. And it was the padlock picking itself up and actually picking itself. <laughs> so my son would do that. Um, I, I, he just does stuff all the time and all the time. So sometimes just really small things. He'll leave me like heart stones. Um, the other day I was going to post this on Instagram today, but I think I was going to do it next week anyway. But on this particular walk, I was like, oh, Davey, here's a heart for you. And then all of a sudden the rest of the walk, I think I saw like, 14 hearts, <laughs> literal heart stones. And so it, it's, he does stuff like that. So very small, but very nice. Beautiful. Do you want to, so we'll talk about translating the information from NDEs and OBEs. Okay. Because we are going over, but as long as you've got the energy and everyone sure. else has hey, the energy. Thanks for sticking in there. <laughs> and then, and then you guys have to stay around until towards the end because Marin lives in a real haunted house. And so she's, uh, uh, we'll show the picture of it and you can okay. hear, she'll explain from firsthand account, uh, different types of after death communication. So okay. don't miss that. All right, so we're, we're gonna talk um, translation. So when we um, leave this body and we're leaving the earthbound plane, so whether it's through an NDE or an OBE, so near death experience or out of body experience, Sometimes um, the translation looks very, very skewed. And sometimes it feels like we were there for a long time. We're like, oh, I was there the whole time I was out. The whole time that this body was done, right when this body died, I went into this tunnel and then I did all these things and then I came back. Well, this is a, a different viewpoint of what actually happened. <laughs> so this body dies and when this body or we're going to say that our brain stops so our brain is not animated right now so no electrical workings in our brain those pathways that we're talking about that are creating that veil subside so now we don't have any veil and we're 
our consciousness is free-flowing consciousness. Now, our consciousness has eternal information, ethereal information, like a lot of information. And information that is not relevant or untranslatable through our brain here. So we're doing whatever it is. We're not seeing words. We're not seeing things in a from the three-dimensional viewpoints. We're not th seeing things two-dimensionally. We're in ethereal world. We're in ethereal realm. Now the second, the millisecond that our brain reanimates, so now we have electrical working in our brain again, it's taking, it has to download where we are because it has, it's restarting. It's like restarting an engine. So it's got to prime the pump and get the gas going and all this kind of stuff. So this information, now we have to quickly close off information that is not relevant to this life experience here. So all of these little frequencies, these pathways are muting and, and regaining some sort of knowledge that we had here before. So maybe sometimes they mute a little bit wrong and we end up with amnesia or, you know, we have other things that are going on. Um, but at the same time, as this is muting, some of this information is coming in. And so we have to take this information, this energy, these frequencies out there and translate them into something that is recognizable here on this earthbound stage. So we look at the, um, it, through studies, lots of studies and, and talking to a lot of people, thousands of people, we see that those translations correlate with what we were taught either as children or what we have heard. So we might see Jesus or we might um, have seen, I don't know, Buddha, who knows. We, we'd see different things. And sometimes when we're translating these things, it's very obscure. And because we have information that we can't translate, then we might have been taught that those frequencies or that stuff that we're trying to translate, we weren't supposed to see it. It would have been bad to see it. And so we translate it into something terrifying. And all of a sudden now we have a very dark near-death experience that is that is terrifying. And you feel like you went to hell. And you're like, I was a good person. Why did I go to hell? But that's due to the translation. And we look back at that translation and we say, okay, what were you taught as a child? What is your belief system today? And we really do look at so many different factors in these translations. Now there's a common thread on these experiences. And one of those common threads is it's indescribable. So we can't describe it. There are no words to put on to this experience. And many, many people just weep. And many, many people feel disconnected from the earth here, from this earthbound stage here, because the information that they got or the experience that they had is still echoing throughout their body. This feeling of something bigger and deeper than love is part of this body and it's very hard to then reassimilate into this life where it feels like a lot of people are blind to the absolute um the absolute <laughs> i was going to try to explain it more but i don't think i need to uh, <laughs> but that but that it's literally the the reanimation of your brain and it's and it's the frequencies quickly muting and then having to translate lingering information into something that's recognizable and as it's doing that we also have to remember that time is something sorry hiccup totally different than what it is on this earthbound stage and so it feels like all of this information that we saw we were there for days and hours and weeks and months and eternal time <clears throat> when actually the images and visions that you're getting are happening in a millisecond so it's, it's really 
very interesting. It's really very cool. And no one went to hell, I promise. Even though I know it was really scary, you didn't go to hell, I promise. <laughs> How is that? <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. So do we want to talk, should we show your house first? Sure. Or, um, well, why don't you tell us about it while I find the photo? Okay. And then I'll share it. Um, all right. So I live on a mountaintop <laughs> and the house, the majority of the house is, is uh, newer built. And then the stonework is obviously it's stone. So it's ancient stone. And um, the there's spiritual imprinting in this stone and the stone was actually quarried from the land itself. Um, I know I'm wondering if we should actually put that up. <laughs> but... Can they see it or no? Is yeah, I, I mean, I'm wondering if we should actually show it, but <laughs> nobody can find their way there. It's yeah, it's hidden. <laughs> it's on the mountaintop. Um, <laughs> it's not something I normally talk about, but <laughs> so it the stone is quarried from the earth. Now, where I live, there's a lot of history out here, and some people say, okay, well, how in the world could you have spiritual imprinting if the majority of the house is newer built? You know, in the last thirty years. Well you have to look at the history of the earth and you have to look at the history of things that were happening around here. And imprinting is um, one form of haunting. And an imprinting happens when we have, it, it would kind of look like this. If you sat down on your bed and you made your bed really great and it's nice and tight and you sat down on it and you stood up, you can see your bottom imprint on that bed. Now that doesn't mean that you are still sitting on the bed. <laughs> that means that you've left an imprint of yourself on that bed. Now imprints can move and they are rep they do a lot of repetition. So maybe you have you're living in a haunted house and you have people walking up and down the corridor or the hallway over and over and over again. That's a spiritual imprint. They're not, there's nobody stuck in limbo. There's nothing that you need to do to get them out of that. That imprint will fade. Just like if you were to sit on your bed, it, your bed will poof back up a little bit and that imprint will fade over time, especially when you start getting more energy and stuff over the top of it. So you hear about haunted bars in Boston or, you know, whatever, wherever else, those are spiritual imprints. Now, the other thing is called a conscious attempt at communication. Now, I have a lot of imprints here. So <laughs> I have a lot of disembodied voices that, so if people were to come here, you would hear disembodied voices. Um, usually it's a, a feminine voice. It's still eerie, <laughs> but it is, it is disembodied. And an example of that is um, when I was doing the remodel last year, the contractor was here by himself while I was at a doctor's appointment for my leg and he didn't think I had left. He didn't, um, we got in the car and we drove off. He was like, are you guys here? And we were like, no, we're at the doctor's. And he searched the whole house for these women that were talking. He says, I can't really hear exactly what they're saying. He says, but their voices are are like they're standing next to me and he walked through the whole house he was like he he's like that was scary <laughs> so i didn't want to be a part of that and then um a conscious attempt at communication is what somebody would um associate with after death communication so if you lose somebody and they're sending you a bird or a butterfly or a stone or you know turning the microwave off and on but not really that far yet little signs that would be a conscious attempt at communication and that's called after death communication now that's the exact same thing as poltergeist activity which is a conscious attempt at communication and if we look at the poltergeist as we would a two or three year old a mischievous two or three year old child that's how we're going to get the poltergeist activity so we have a conscious entity now the conscious entity is part of this 
um, overarching consciousness that they once were, and they they have the symphony, but they they are thinkers. <laughs> Your consciousness thinks; it has thought, and it can be jovial. <laughs> But it also wants to get your attention. So let's say that it's 100 years ago and I had lost my son 100 years ago. And I started getting these hints at communication and someone told me, nope, there's no such thing. And if you're getting those things, it's evil. You need to have your house saged. You need to push them away. Get them out of here. And so you quiet them down. And they're like, fine, that was no fun. And I just wanted to say I love you. But they don't really have a message. They just kind of want to say, I love you. I'm okay. So I move out of the house and the next person moves in. And this conscious entity, my son, is sitting there going, hmm, well. And he's not stuck in the house or anything. He's just looking back and going, huh, maybe I'll get these people's attention. And so he throws a book off the wall. And, the, and it actually gets their attention. The person goes, what? Did you just see that? Seriously, a book just fell off the wall. And, and now the conscious consciousness up there that's trying to communicate down here is like, Ooh, that worked. That was really great. And then he does it again. And people are like, ah, it's old hat. He just throws books off the wall. So he has to up the ante. And now what can we do? Hmm. Well, she's in the kitchen. Okay. I'm going to throw a knife. Maybe that will get her attention. Not intending to hurt you to get your attention. I'm going to have blood drip from the ceiling. That should really freak them out. But it's it's more like going to a haunted house. It's it's not meant to be scary or anything like that. And the easiest way to stop poltergeist activity is to turn around. And you can do this if you want to. But treat it like a two or three year old child and say, Okay, I have seen you. And I have heard you. And now we are going to play different games. <laughs> I mean, really, truly, you can stop a poltergeist activity in their tracks just by recognizing and saying, wow, that was fantastic. Now let's try something else. <laughs> and then usually they, they go away. So, so you just again, put a lot of it can look really scary. It can, <laughs> huh? You just put a lot of exorcist out of work. I know, but that's basically what they're doing. But sometimes even exorcism doesn't work because yes. um, they're just they're they're poo pooing it and they're not taking it seriously. Even though exorcism is supposed to be taking it seriously, and they're like, "Oh yeah, it's here, it's here," they're not really. It's more of um, a show to push somebody else away rather than it's just like the pain we were talking about earlier. Step into it. Step into it and say, okay, I saw you. That's enough. <laughs> yeah. And so done. what about, okay, so here's a really good question, which, mm -hmm. um, uh, so let's say you grow up in a house with a lot of turmoil, parents fighting, all kinds of stuff. Can okay. humans, through depression and, and all the stuff that goes on, can they create, can they create negative energy that then other energies attached to you know what i'm saying can people create poltergeist or invite them in through their negative energy Do you, does that make sense yeah i'm i'm thinking how to answer that you're not going to have an energy attached to you. you're not going to have an entity attached to you you have your your energetic footprint is yours so any disruption to that your body would actually cease so your body works in a very precise manner. Your electrical organism, your electrical current is very, very precise. Any change to that and your body could cease to exist. So imagine, you know, sticking a fork in a light socket. You can't do that because you'll, you could die. <laughs> so you really can't have another entity attach themselves to you. You're not going to have an entity come in because if they have a different polarity or they have a different, which they do guaranteed because our, our polarity, our, um, frequency, our current is just as unique as our thumbprint. So there's only one of us. <laughs> um, so, but we can, so through, I'm trying to get this the easiest way. 
when you have a group of people and they're all happy and you have one person come in and they are depressed or sad or something like that, rather than that person becoming happy, the whole group by biology goes into what's fight, flight, freeze. And so you bring the whole mood down. Now, when you grow up in an, in an abusive situation and you have depression and, and whatever else you have, you're in a constant state of fight, flight, freeze, and you're in a constant state of turmoil. And it is very, very, very hard to get out of that because of the chemicals running through your body. You can draw in by picking out all the negativity. You can make a house feel horrid. I mean, you really can. And people can walk in and that house will feel heavy because that's the energy that you're exuding out there. And everything has this fight, flight, freeze response. Plants have it. Everything has it. And so you can change the energy of the room. So it's much easier to to darken a room than it is to lighten a room. And that's going to be up to you and, and um, realizing and understanding that you, if you're no longer in that situation, that you are okay and that you are safe and that they can't hurt you anymore. And once you understand that, not believe it, but understand that, then that energy changes within you. And then if that's your house environment, your house environment will start to change because you have a, you have the most significant energy in your house. Perfectly said. That's absolutely perfect. So what we what I think we'll last ask one last question that okay. several people have been asking me, and so many people are you know feel 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 what you went through as a child. How have you found happiness now, your biologic, and how do you look at your biological family? I love them very much. I've never not loved them. Um, I, I think I've always been a pretty level, I guess, calm. It's not like I'm jubilantly happy and I'm not depressed. <laughs> I'm just here. And I've kind of carried that with me all the time for whether I fell out of a tree and skinned my knee or had a whole bunch of different events happen in my adulthood and my childhood. Um, I'm able to do that because I believe in the more, M-O-R-E. And I understand that every single moment is absolutely precious. And I don't know why I started thinking that way. It's not Pollyanna syndrome. It's just that every moment is precious, even, even the dark moments are precious and and you know I've, I've been in dark moments beautiful thank you so much i want to remind everybody to go to marinmuter.com she has amazing firesides twice twice a month is or is it twice a month or yeah. and in the morning and at night also soon if you uh, any donations that you make to her website you'll get to try her chocolate as uh, a thank you gift and uh oh and also please join us on the 20th of september for our sharing group for people who have not been it's for people you don't have to have had just ndes but any spiritually transformative experience you're welcome to come and uh, it's, a, it's a safe place for, for experiencers to share your stories. And if you haven't had any experiences, you can just come and listen. Yeah. But and those are fabulous. You. I love those share groups. I just love hearing people's experience. 
Yes. And we love having you. Were, you were, at, I think, the very first one that we did, the Hawaiian Islands one, the very first one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Maren, for, and for Hi. sharing your beautiful house. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha to you. <laughs> Aloha. Everyone, thank you. Have a great night, and we'll see you all soon. All right. Bye. Bye.